This is an iPhone 6 Plus that came in with touch disease symptoms. And as you'll see here shortly, if you try to move the screen, you can't really get too much in the way of swiping this thing. So obviously not a lot you can do with your phone if you can't operate the touch screen. Now, the reason I want to make this video is because it's a little different than most of the touch disease phones I've worked on. My understanding is that this was some sort of warranty or insurance replacement. So the customer had problems with the phone, turned in their old one, and this was presented to them as a replacement, refurbished, uh, repaired, whatever you want to call it. I'm not sure who performed the repair. It could have been the insurance company. I don't think that this came through Apple, but no way to tell for sure. Anyways, we're going to open it up and get this thing going again. Now, as soon as you take a look on the inside here, you see all sorts of barcode stickers and strange things. There's a check mark on the battery. So obviously this has been through someone's uh, if you want to call it quality control check, I guess. There are also colors on the screws. So what they did is they took a marker, or different colored markers, and they literally drew over the screw heads, I assume, so that they would know where to put them back inside the phone when they got finished. I would recommend that you organize your screws instead of relying on some colored pens or anything like that to get it back together. But hey, you know, whatever works. That's not really the issue with this phone. Now before I peeled the sticker off of the back side of this, you can already kind of see that it's been removed at least one time before. They didn't really align it properly, which is not a big deal. I'm not really concerned about that. But the fact that this sticker has been removed led me to believe that they probably put a shim inside here, something that's supposed to put pressure on the back of the Touch IC so that it will kind of hold it in place and keep the solder joints from separating, which is obviously not a proper fix. That's not going to be permanent. And I'm very confused as to how this phone was issued as is, although it hasn't been properly repaired. But as we peel this back, just wait to see to what, to my wondering eyes did appear. I have never seen this before. The Mason IC has got some sort of material. It's not, it doesn't really feel like silicone, and yet it's not hard enough to be an epoxy. So I'm not sure exactly what this is, but you can see what they did is they put this glue, or whatever you like to call it, all around the chip, and it's pretty dense. Again, it's not like a rubbery silicone feel. It's a little more hard than that, and I don't really know how to describe it. It's not, I'd say probably a little more dense than underfill typically is, but not too much. And when I first saw this, I almost said, yeah, I don't want to work on this phone because obviously there can be some additional damage caused by removing this chip. So. The question was, how do we get it off without causing any other problems? And of course, I let the customer know what had happened, documented this, sent them pictures so they can see what's going on before we start doing any work here. Now, beyond pulling any adjacent components out, my other concern, of course, is that this gluey stuff, whatever it is, has gotten underneath. It probably seeped under the chip. So we want to be very careful in removing this. What I'm going to do is take a couple of tools. I start out with a tweezer, and I have a nice flat edge that I use to just kind of very carefully remove underfill in combination with some hot air, which makes it a little easier to work with. And so that is going to be on this phone, the major first step really to replacing this IC. So I'm gonna come in with some hot air about 150 degrees Celsius. That usually works well enough with underfill and won't cause any damage to the surrounding components. It's not nearly hot enough to melt anything that's metal or solder but it should make it a little easier to pry this stuff out. And you can see it just kind of comes out in chunks at a few points here. I tried to get it all together, you know, try to get one big piece and kind of peel it out, but it didn't really cooperate. So this was the more tedious part, I would say, of this repair. All right, so that took a while, thus the time lapse speeding up the camera there. But once I got this fairly clear around the edges, I think it's safe to go ahead and go in and heat this off and hope for the best. So I'm gonna reposition the board here because it makes it easier for me to grab with my tweezers. And then we'll get some more heat, a little more heat this time. And I do like to kind of preheat this surface a bit so that we can flow some flux 
around the edges and obviously you know this is kind of done out of habit and I hadn't even thought at this point about the fact that that flux is like not likely to get underneath the chip because there's this goo whatever you want to call it uh, residual stuff left underneath from it being injected or whatever term you want to use for applying that to the edges and it, it's really surprising because obviously this is not going to prevent the foam from flexing so as far as a preventative measure it doesn't seem like putting any of that stuff on there and it really just adds to the inevitable which is having to remove it so we can get under the chip but as you can see here not too much of that seeped underneath it wasn't terrible I really was anticipating the worst here but for the most part cleaning off around the edges I believe is going to be sufficient at least in this case now you may get unlucky hopefully you won't but otherwise we should be able to do a proper fix at this point and run the M1 jumper so that we don't have to worry about future touch disease issues on this phone all right so let's go ahead and get these pads tinned since we've already added new flux and I try not to actually touch the pad with the iron I'm just using a big ball of solder that is kind of on the end to just touch these enough so that they're evened out we remove the oxidation and hopefully they end up level enough so that when we put the new chip on here it's going to sit flat and then of course on this one we're going to have to take an extra step before we install the new touch IC and that is to run the jumper as I mentioned which is the fun part all right let's get this cleaned up so we can see what we're doing and zoom it in a bit and there is our defective pad as far as I know that seems to be the problem second one from the left on the top row that guy likes to come loose and not have a solid connection for whatever reason so we're going to augment that connection by adding a small piece of jumper wire and I will put links to the tools and materials that were used in this repair in case you're interested in them just take a look down in the video description or you can click through on the card at the top right hand corner and visit my website gocellphonerepair.com we do also of course offer these repairs for customers so if you need your phone fixed let me know I'm gonna scrape away a bit here so that we can expose the area that we need to connect to now a bit of fresh flux and some solder so we have something to connect to and I'm going to touch up this pad just a hair looks like it was shy on the solder and now the tiniest of tiny wires here we need to cut just a small section I wanted to try to do this on camera it's a little difficult to cut this wire under the microscope but you definitely want some sharp tweezers or you can use a razor blade or whatever else but that's roughly the length that we're looking at right here good pair of tweezers will make your life easier also all right let's get our wire tinned so it'll be easy to solder this together and when you put heat and a bit of leaded solder on the end of this it will melt away the enamel that coats this wire so these jumper wires are made not to conduct anything as you take it off the roll you've got to burn away that coating so that's what makes it safe to work with but it does I mean you've got to get some tin on the end before you start well it makes your life more easier if you do I mean there are a number of ways you can do it fun part of course is getting this thing into position and the flux will help out with that but I never want to say it's at least for me it's not super easy it's definitely something you have to work out for a second all right so we're just going to kind of hold this down so it's flush make sure we've got it in the right spot and then it's just a brief touch here for this thing to attach so you don't have to spend much time on it and then we're going to have a little slack on this thing 
two pairs of tweezers will actually make this step easier. So we'll clean away a bit of this flux so we can get a better view. And in fact, uh, what I'm going to do on this one is go ahead and put some solder mask on top of this wire to stabilize it because what tends to happen is as you go to heat the other end, the wire is so thin that the heat goes all the way through it and you end up losing your connection on the first part where we attached it. So I'm going to clean up this surface. We'll put a small amount of solder mask on top of here. You, it's really the less you use, the better to a certain extent. More is absolutely not better because it takes forever to dry. So we're just going to put a tiny little dab here right in the center and this will hold the wire up against the board. And then I'm going to put this under a fluorescent lamp. It doesn't take too long to cure as long as you don't put it on too thick. I'll make sure that's setting down flat. And we'll go dry this thing out. All right, so once your solder mask is cured, you've got something to kind of hold everything together, which is nice because, you know, if it does become detached, you can just go and put some more heat on there and stick it back onto the pad or back onto the area where you where you attached it without everything floating away on you. So this stuff comes in really, really handy. So you can see I just kind of looped it around to the pad that we want to get to. That way we have a bit of extra length in case this thing does start getting flexed. It's going to be less likely to break that connection to the wire. So I've got some flux on there and this is going to be the last step for the jumper, a little too much flux. And I'm just going to kind of stabilize it while we touch that. And again, it, you know, it doesn't take much to get that to stay down. All right, so we'll clean this up one more time. Just make sure everything's looking good. And of course, when we install our replacement part, we want to have fresh flux anyways. All right, so that looks about ready to go. Let's get some flux and spread this out evenly. Add a bit of heat and that will, I believe activate is the right term. This flux, once it flows out after it goes into a liquid state like that, it becomes a little more sticky, which is nice because this should help to hold our chip, our IC in place as we heat it up. Otherwise they tend to slide around a bit. I want to make sure I've got all of those areas where we're going to attach the solder balls. Otherwise we can have some problems. Now's the fun part, getting this thing positioned. And if you take a look, I may not have caught it on camera, but if you look at a board like this, you can see that the edges will align with nearby components. So if you take a look, for example, on the bottom right hand corner, you can see that it almost lines up exactly where that capacitor, the larger one on the bottom right hand, is. So if you take note of that stuff, and same with the top left hand corner, you can kind of see that it lines up you know, vertically and horizontally with the adjacent components. And if you've already taken yours off, you can go back and look at the video from the beginning. And you'll see that there's kind of a guide because guessing where these balls are, you know, you can kind of estimate it by looking and then setting the chip down. But it's very easy to lose your place if it tends, to, if it happens to shift on you. So for that reason, I like to take a look beforehand take note of where the orientation is and where it's setting and then that way we kind of have something to use judgment wise as far as getting this lined up. Now the nice thing about this is it's pretty easy to go in with the microscope once you've got it attached and look at it from the side and you can see the outer row of those solder balls and make sure that they're connected to the right place. All right, so I'm gonna start warming this up slowly by coming in from a distance first. And once we know that the, the flux is liquefied, we can get a little closer. This is all really practice, but what we're looking for is enough temperature to get that chip to kind of shift into position. Then we'll give it a bit of a nudge. And if it goes back, you see it, hopefully there it just moved. I'm gonna nudge it a bit. And when it goes back straight, we know that everything's liquefied and that it's sitting 
in the right position. And again, uh, we'll come back and check later. I will let the board cool down, obviously, before we do too much with it. But uh, when it's under the microscope, you should be able to make sure that your alignment is correct. And from there, we'll plug it in and test it. I'm going to do that without fully assembling the phone, which is what I recommend everyone does, because you certainly don't want to have to tear the whole thing down again. But we'll get this nice and clean first. Just get all this flux off while it's still warm, because it's kind of a headache to work with once it cools down. All right, so what I'm going to do is take the logic board from the phone. We're going to connect a display, and I'm going to use my power supply, which I can't say enough good things about this little iPower device that we have here. So what this is going to do is attach to the battery terminal and the charge port flex connector so that we can actually turn the phone on with a button. It's pretty cool. So I've got this this little piece right here. It's attached to my power supply. That just plugs in on the bottom end of the phone where your battery and charge port connector would be. And let's get that out of the way. We'll turn on the power supply and make sure we set it to the correct voltage and amperage. And I did not have my power supply plugged in, so I am shifting some cords around here. There we go. So I've got mine set at 3.8 and 2 amps. Plug it in, turn on the power. Let's turn this light down so maybe you can see a little better. Make sure we've got this turned on. We hit the power button on the iPower, and then there's a power on option on this thing. I'm going to hit that, and we should get an Apple logo. I'll give this thing a second to boot up. All right, let's go ahead and, well, it looks like the touch is working. Let me get the password on this thing. All right, go ahead and put in the password, and for privacy purposes, I'm doing that off camera. All right, we've got this thing unlocked, and our touch screen is working again. If you found the video helpful, be sure to hit the like button, subscribe, and check out our weekly Tech Talk live stream. Have a great one and thanks for watching.